it's, it's funny that today has its challenges uh, for me. I, I'm, as you kind of get set up for this, one of the things that, that, that hits me as I'm, I'm preparing for this morning is last night there's going to be a, an inch of ice and everybody's going to be dead and there's going to be no power, which means no curling irons, which means no families can come, um, <laughs> which, you know what I mean? And then to come in today and to see a full house. I, like, congratulations, Freedom Center Church, for driving by faith and not by sight. Um, I have no doubt that whether you're here or you're, you're watching by live stream, you're all asking the same question. Why is he wearing Ohio State colors? The answer that everyone's been asking, or the question, here's the answer. No, I did not lose a bet. I was thinking Christmas at the wrong time. And so I, I'm not celebrating the devil. But I, I would say here today that uh, it's all good. So uh, we, we've taken the last three months, guys, and we've talked about things, and we're going to connect a couple more dots in the month of December. If you weren't here, or rather you have a lot of visitors during this time of year because of family and so forth. First of all, my name's Jim. I get to be the senior pastor here, which is just crazy, and I welcome you, and I'm so glad that you're, that you're a part of this today um, because today's an important day. We've been talking for the last few months about the stewardship of time. We talked the entire month of October about budgeting our minutes, our moments, our hours, our weeks, about pace, about rhythm, about what the Garden of Eden was like, what happened after the fall, about Sabbath and the laws. Um, we, we ended up with like seven hours of sleep every night, five hours of free time every day, 11 hours of work. It was, it was incredible. We had time for God first thing. Uh, in November, we shifted that to the stewardship of our resource. We really talked about, you know, the, the, the weight that debt can create. As Christmas is coming up, remember this. Slaves are made out of people who God provides here, and we decide to live here, and we borrow that difference. We're borrowing against our income, and slavery is what the Bible says is the end result. We don't worship something called mammon. We worship someone called Jesus. Amen. So, do you are the world, the Lord has come. Keep your credit card in your pocket. Amen. If, if God hasn't provided it, listen, all blessings come from God, and if it doesn't come from God, it's not a blessing. It's just stuff. So let, let's not sell tomorrow's future on today's Chinese plastic for our children. So there are memories that are important. How many of you guys ever bought a gift that cost $30, $40, dollars and the kid played with the box more than the toy? Come on. And the box was free. Go to Goodwill. Just buy boxes. It's wonderful. So make memories. Those are important. We talked about wealth building. We talked about the generosity. And then last month, we talked all about just this incredible, beautiful opportunity to, uh, to grow in the knowledge of who we are. What's your passion? What's your pain? What's your proficiency? And those things adding up to kind of give us a clue about our purpose. Today, we're going to go one step farther because I, I, my concern is this. The, these lights, for example, are wonderful. Are they not? Did they do a great job decorating this, all this kind of stuff? So think of it this way. That Christmas light, if it had a consciousness, would realize it has a filament, it has wire, it has garland around it, um, all that kind of stuff. It's wonderful. But, but until it's plugged in, it's powerless to produce what it was created to produce. So today we're going to talk about not just knowing what we are and the substance of our being, what our passion, pain, proficiency is, but actually getting to the place where we say, now, how do I connect who I am to God's purpose for my life? There, there, uh, there's a statement I want you to consider, and we do this from time to time. A.W. Tozer said something really great. The most important thing a man thinks is what he thinks when he thinks about God. I, I'm not going to do this right now, but if you were to close your eyes and say, now, describe to me what you imagine God to be. Some people, well, he's got a long beard. Um, he's a white dude on a big chair. Um, he's got a scepter in his hand. There's angels, you know, flying around. He looks like the king of Norway. Um, you know what I mean? What does Jesus look like? Is he distant? Is he near? Is he far? And we begin to say, now, is he frowning? Is he looking at you with a stern look because he knows what you did yesterday? Or is he looking at you with a kind smile because he knows whose you are? You see how those things can change everything about you? You ever run into somebody that's so religious, they drive you crazy, they're judgmental and mean and make God sound like the biggest, worst guy in the world? You know what I'm talking about? The reason people do that is because when they think about God, they think God is treating them that way. And so godliness looks like judgment. But what if godliness isn't judgment? What if godliness is patience? What if godliness is generosity? What if godliness is kindness? What if godliness is not, aha, I caught you sinning. Here's the Ten Commandments. You broke one. I got tablets in one hand, a rolling pin in the other, and I'm playing whack-a-mole with all humanity. I mean, that probably isn't who God is and what God does. It probably is a stretch. I would say it definitely is not who God is and what God does. So there's a big difference between these three statements. Number one is, I believe in God. 87% of Americans last year were asked, do you believe in God? 87% said, yes, 
I believe that there's a God. It, it can be the forest Luke, it can be nebulous, it can be the Easter Bunny, it can be the earth, it can be the sky, it can be idolatry, it can be the God of the Bible. But 87%, almost 9 out of 10 Americans when asked, do you believe in God? I said, yeah, I, I believe in God. But there's a difference between I believe in God and I believe God. There's a difference. When I say I believe in God, there's really no commitment. There's no change. It doesn't make any real difference on, on a normal day. I believe God makes a difference. Why? Because now I'm trusting someone. It, it's a relational statement. It's something that says there's a, there's a foundation, there's a footing, there's an anchor for my soul. I believe God. And the last thought is this. I, I believe that God believes in me. Now, look at the three statements. You see the vast difference? Are you still here? Come on, you made it through the snow. Don't die now. I want to get you to a place of faith before you leave here because I don't know what's going to happen once you leave. Amen, right? I believe in God. Wonderful. Good for you. You're an American. I believe God. It goes down to about 40% of people that would say, I actually trust what God's word, the basic tenets of faith says. I believe that God believes in me. There's no polling data on this, but I would say it's less than 10%. When people wake up in the morning, they ignore God. They say, I trust you, or they say, let's get him. There's three different ways to live, right? Now, let's take a look at this. Because on a normal day, I believe in God. What happened? Nothing. <laughs> it makes no difference at all. I believe in God at the bar. I believe in God. You know, my three girlfriends don't know about each other, and I'm really thankful to God that they don't. You know what I mean? I believe in God. I, you know, I'm, I'm not a Muslim. I'm not a Hindu. I'm not an atheist. I believe in God. So, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm an American. My, my grandfather's grandfather was a preacher, so I think I'm in. Right? I believe in God, nothing happened. A normal day, I believe God. On a normal day, if you believe God, does it change your day? You better believe it does. Why? Because now there's, there's a relationship. I'm talking to God. I'm listening for God. I'm reading his word. I'm, I'm, all of his promises are yes and amen. I want to know his promises. I want to get in on that, right? What about this one? On a normal day, if I believe that God believes in me, does that change the way you wake up in the morning? That change the way you go to work in the day? That change your relationships? Absolutely. Listen, these are three levels, progressive levels of faith. I think just about everybody starts with number one. So I'm not, I'm an atheist. I'm so glad you're here. I used to be one. Let me tell you how, how I went from, I, I did this great revelation from atheism to agnosticism. You want to hear what happened? Someone drew a circle and they said, this represents all knowledge in the universe. Every square inch of all existence, a billion light years away. You know everything there is all the way from the beginning of time through now. This is all knowledge that can be known. How much of this would you say you know? How many guys know that a completely arrogant person would draw like a line? Most people draw a small dot. Well, is it possible then, they would say, that in all of this vastness that you say you know nothing about, is it possible that God exists? You just haven't experienced him. You just don't know about him. You just haven't been to that planet yet. You just haven't had that revelation. And those who would say, no, it's not possible, are utterly arrogant, and you should not waste your time talking to them. I love them, but they're not ready to talk. Does that make sense? So when someone draws a circle and I go, man, well, I, I guess I can't know that. They say, congratulations. You can never again say you're an atheist. Now you're an agnostic. I thought, well, that feels good. I've really grown, you know. So a, a normal day, I believe in God. I believe God. I believe God believes in me. Three completely different ways to wake up in the morning. What about this? A great opportunity, business opportunity, relational opportunity, an opportunity to go on a missions trip, an opportunity to trust God for something great. I believe in God. You know what happens when you see a great opportunity? Really nothing. God plays no role in it. I believe in God. He's way over there. It's a bet Midler relationship from a distance. God is watching us, right? I believe God and a great opportunity is set before me. Does that make a difference? It certainly can because now I have something to stand on. This could be a promise from God. I, I know that God's, you know, giving me an appetite uh, to, to be with someone and Dina walks in the room and well, I'm trusting God for a wife. That's different than I believe in God. I believe God and I'm waiting for a promise to walk through the door. Or I believe that God believes in me when a great opportunity comes. I go, here's my moment. Because God believes in me. God's waiting to unleash what he's put inside of me into the earth. I'm, I'm ready for this. Like, bring her on, bring it on, bring you on, because I, I just believe that I'm not supposed to nine to five black coffee, white picket fence my life until I die. I, I don't want to arrive safely at death. I want to slide in the home plate bloody. You know what I mean? I, I want to get there having my, my last check that my, my grandchildren's inheritance is from bounced, right? You know what I'm saying? Just not bounced, but it was the last dollar, right? So what about this one? Uh, something terrible happens. I don't know why it's in larger font, but isn't it scary? <laughs> terrible happens, right? And I believe in God. Did anything happen? Can I tell you something? Yeah. If you believe in God and something terrible happens, it's actually worse to believe in God than not to believe in God. 
Because now that something bad happened, you begin to ask questions about this God. Like, where was God when? If God knew, then why didn't he? Why would God allow? You know the number one thing that I come against when I'm, when I'm talking to people about their faith in God, getting them from I believe in God to I believe God to God believes in me? It's what do you do with pain? What do you do with loss? What do you do with betrayal? What do you, what do, you do with death? What do you do with bankruptcy? What do you do with divorce? If God is real, I, I believe in God, but God didn't do jack for me. Now we're mad at the God we barely knew anything about. This makes sense? One of the worst things, 90%, 87% of Americans, 9 out of 10 Americans say, I believe in God. And when something bad happens, listen, if you believe that God believes in you, it's still hard. You still grieve. It's still painful. It still hurts. If you believe God, it, it's, still, it's still painful. It still hurts. But there's a place to take that pain anchored in the word of God. I believe God, or I believe that God believes in me. Therefore, like Dean already said, Romans 8, 28, all things are going to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purposes. There's a reason. I was just in, in Rome the other day, and we're sitting where, where Paul's jail cell is. You realize that three-quarters of the New Testament books are written by a guy who wrote most of them from prison? And he was in prison because he obeyed God. I'm telling you guys, the Christian life is not all roses and joy and happiness and blessings. Sometimes it's difficult persecutions. Blessed are you when you face trials of many kinds. I mean, guys, well, that doesn't feel like a blessing. You're right, it doesn't feel like a blessing. That's why we need someone to tell us that it is. Because our intuition would tell us this is not a blessing, this is a curse. And James goes, no, no, you're blessed when you face trials of many kinds. Why? Because just like when you go to the gym, it's painful, but you get ripped. It's painful, but you get strong. It's painful, but you don't age the way that people that don't go to the gym age. Right? This is the same thing. Blessed are you when you face trials of many kinds because the testing of your faith... The testing, not just faith, I believe God, but the testing of your faith develops perseverance, and perseverance has a work to complete. So you can be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And I say this all the time, but you say, how many of you guys want maturity, completeness, and abundance in Christ? Y'all go, yay, sign me up for that class. How do I get there? Well, just go through hell and turn left. I'm sorry if I pointed right at you. I don't see very well. I'm like, why did he point right at me when he said hell? You know, I don't know, Right? So something terrible happens. I believe in God. It's actually a negative thing because we're mad at a God who didn't do what we wanted to do. I believe God. We're anchored, although we're in pain and we can be confused. I believe that God believes in me. Then all things are working together for my good. Even if my death punctuates my faith, as it did in the case of Paul, Peter, James, John, they died in the faith, and, and because of that, they silenced the argument that they started this cult out of Judaism that was just a, a flavor of the month club that got mistaken by the Roman government. Listen, when people look at it, was, was the first generation of Christians, did they really believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Well, they were executed for their faith in that very thing. I'm telling you, God can use anything, including bad things to create good things for generations later. Are you still here? Say amen. So we're going to take a look at this in real time. My clock's not working, so I have 12 minutes, according to my watch, which is never wrong. And I look like Wonder Woman when I do that, so I'm not going to do that again. So <laughs> let's, let's take a look at the conversation in real time between uh, God and Moses. 400 years of slavery. He's out watching sheep one day, and God speaks through a burning bush and says this. And now the cry of the Israelites has reached me, and I've seen the ways the Egyptians are oppressing them. The, the Israelites. So now go, he says to Moses, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Now look at this. But Moses said to God, who am I? Isn't that crazy? Listen, he's talking to God and God is telling him who he is and what he's about to do. And he's saying, I'm sending you and you're going to bring my people out. And he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but really, I think what you're looking for is not me. Who, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Now, Moses believes in God. He's talking to him, but he doesn't believe God yet, and he doesn't believe that God believes in him. So God begins just to work the problem. He goes, and God said, I will be with you. And evidently, because of the size of the font, he said it really loud. <laughs> All cap emoji, right? So what's he saying? He's basically saying this. Who am I? And he goes, no, no, it's not about you. It's about me. It's not about where you're going. It's about where we're going. It's not about what's in your heart to do. It's you're going to do what's in my heart. And I've waited 400 years for this moment. Mo, come on. You're talking to a bush. I mean, all we need now, we've got a singing bush. We need the invisible swordsman. And, and we'll have a whole 
Three Amigos scene, right? If you didn't get that, YouTube, but it's funny. Kim got it. Thanks for being old, Kim. I appreciate that. So Moses still doesn't get it. And so the conversation continues. Look at Exodus chapter 4. Moses answered, what if they do not believe me? Who's, who's the issue here? They don't believe me or listen to me and say the Lord did not appear to you. Now Moses is imagining what obedience might look like. Anybody ever been there? How many of know when God says to do stuff, sometimes it's just better not to think about it. I literally this morning, this is so funny, babe. You ever have that thought where you're like, I feel like this is for somebody, and you say it, but afterwards you're like, oh, I don't know if that's for anybody. It's just for me. That was for me. And I think it was for other people too. Anybody else that word was that Dina gave today about doing the math in your head? Totally for me. Literally during worship, I'm over there going, okay, so I just got this, this check that came in, and I've got this other, but what if I pay off? God, I just need to be obedient. And she goes, you know, some of you guys couldn't worship this morning because you're doing the math in your head. I'm like, oh, that's scary. <laughs> right? I'm imagining what obedience might look like. And worship is paying the price for my distractions. And then my wife calls me out in the name of the Lord. Anybody else having a good day? <laughs> it's a good day. It is, right? So uh, Moses imagining what obedience might look like. He finds a problem. It's not God's problem. It's Moses' problem. And this is the deal. He's sending him back to his worst nightmare. Remember that place where you murdered somebody and you ran for your life about 40 years ago that you've been trying to forget? Remember those people that knew who you were? And when you walk back to the door, we'll say, hey, there's that murderer. There's, there's, that, there's that guy that thought he was all that in a bag of chips, and our boss had to run him out of town. Like, he fled for his life and had to hide out in the wilderness. He looks different. He's a sheep herder now. He's not in a palace. He, he's wearing rags. He's, he smells like sheep. The Egyptians hated sheep herders. They were the lowest of the low. They were like, there's like, you know, tax collectors, slave things, Ohio State fans. I mean, they were right down there. I said in my red shirt, right? And you're calling me back to face my worst fears. He believes in God. He's talking to him. And he's starting to, you see the difference? He's afraid because he's starting to believe God. Anybody ever been there? I believe in God, but now I'm starting to believe God. But if I really believe God to a place of trust, he's going to ask me to do all kinds of stuff I don't think I want to do. Come on, anybody else been there? I heard a couple of honest people kind of chuckle like, oh, yeah. And so... What if they don't believe me? Listen to me. They say the Lord didn't appear to you. The problem's not God, guys. In Moses' life, I'm not talking to any of us, but in Moses' life, the problem isn't God. The problem is something else. And so he says to him, then the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? A staff, a stick, he replied. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. So Moses threw it on the ground. I mean, so some obedience is better than others. It's a stick, throw it on the ground, no sweat. I'm getting this. It turns into a snake, and he screams and runs away. Things aren't getting better. But the point of what's happening here is this. God's saying, Mo, it's a stick. It's a stick. Do you see what my power can do through a stick? Then what do you think my power can do through you if you're willing to lay yourself down like you laid that stick down? You hear what I'm saying? Like the problem, God's just working the problem. The problem is not that he doesn't believe in God. And the problem is not anymore that he doesn't believe God. The problem is he doesn't believe that God believes in him. Do you see this in your own life? So he's saying, I want you to do something amazing. Oh, no, no, I, I can't. You, what if they say to me, I, I just, uh. the problem isn't God, guys. The problem isn't that we don't believe in God. The problem is that we don't believe God. The problem really comes where we, like, I, I have to believe that God believes in me and wants to use me because we know what we've done. We know where we've been. We know our weaknesses, right? Moses still is wrestling as all mankind will wrestle with this very conversation to believe that God believes in him. And it continues. Exodus chapter 4, verse 10. Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant, Lord. I've never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you've spoken to your servant. You know, this last 30 seconds. I'm slow of speech and of tongue. I, <laughs> isn't it funny that he could say I'm a murderer, but he doesn't? Isn't it funny that he could say I'm a coward, but that's not the issue. He literally is imagining obedience, but if I get up there and stutter, people will laugh at me. The problem is not the security of God. The problem is the insecurity of man. I'm picturing what it would look like to obey you. I'm picturing what it would look like to go. I'm picturing what it would look like to give. I'm picturing what it would look like to sacrifice. I'm picturing what it would look like to pray that prayer publicly that others would hear me actually say those words out loud. I'm picturing what it would look like to love my wife as Christ of the church. I'm picturing what it would look like to lay my life down for my family. I'm picturing what it would look like to submit to my husband. I'm, I'm picturing life in obedience to God. And it's just, uh, you don't know my past. You don't know my limitations. You don't know what I've been through. And God's like, I know it all. <laughs> Yo, shocking. Didn't know that about you, said the omniscient one. Right? 
The problem has nothing to do. We have, we have the worst excuses. He's literally saying, would you just pass me by because I stutter? I'm calling you to go and to deliver my people out of 400 years of slavery. Sounds good, but I got a speech impediment. So please hang up and try your call again. The Lord said to him really loud once more, who gave human beings their mouths? Is it not I, the Lord? And again, God comes back and goes, every limitation you have, I'm fully aware of. Every disqualification you can point to, I have compensated for. What I'm asking you to do, what I'm, what I'm asking you to do right now is just simply trust me, that I trust you. Here, here's our last one. You ready? Look at this. Exodus chapter 3. I know we're going back a chapter, but I, I want to put it in a different order. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and, and say to them, the God of your, of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what's his name? Now, is that the weakest excuse of all? What's his name? I don't know. Well, we don't believe you if you don't know his name. The guy comes down off the mountain with a glowing face, but they want to know his name, right? And they ask me, what's his name? Then what shall I tell them? What if they ask me a question? You ever been there? What if I stand up for Jesus? What if I tell someone about my faith? What if I, what if I and they ask me a question? I don't know the answer. So until I know all the answers, I've been doing this a long time. I'm still in third grade. I mean, all I've done really is, is study the Bible and, and study from the Bible how to serve for 30 years. People ask me questions all the time. I don't know the answer. You know the best answer when you don't know the answer? I don't know. It's a good question. It's a hard question. I'll, I'll make a commitment. I'll study it. You study it. Let's meet for coffee next week and see what we come up with. No, your pastor is supposed to know everything. I know enough to know that I don't know enough now. <laughs> yeah, that's a wonderful life. Favorite movie, by the way. God said to Moses really loud, and this is what he says. I am who I am. This is what you're to tell the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Boy, that's a powerful statement. Let me wrap it up. You guys ready to wrap it up? The name of the series is this. I am, therefore I am. I know it's confusing. It's, it's purposely so. I, he says that when they ask you what's his name, tell them his name is I am. How many of you guys know no sentence ends with I am? There's always a third word. I am something. I am something. And, and this is the point. He, he says, Moses, I'm telling you who I am. Now hear me. Everybody hear me. Because if you know who I am, from there, you'll know who you are. Who do men say that I am? Jesus asked the disciples. Well, some say you're this, and some say you're that, and some say you're a lunatic, and some say you're well, I, uh, Who do you say that I am? Peter goes, I know who you are. You're the Christ. You're the Messiah. You're the anointed one. You're the son of the living God. And Jesus goes, blessed are you, Peter, son of Jonas. Because man didn't show you this. And my Father in heaven shows you this. And now that you know who I am, the next statement is this. And I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Isn't it interesting that as soon as Jesus was known by Peter, Jesus made Peter known to Peter. Before that, he was the loudmouth. He was the fisherman. He was the abrasive one. He was the, the, the water walker falling after two steps guy. He was the, I know, I, I'll never. And, and finally, Jesus said, let me tell you who you really are. Now that you know who I am, I can tell you who you are. God says the same thing to Moses. You, you believe that there's a me? Good for you. Believing me is different from that. And believing that I believe in you is a revelation that comes out of knowing who I am. The reason we're connecting these dots from three months of study into this next month, because knowing that you're a light bulb is different from being plugged in and shining. Knowing that you're a car that has no gas is unfulfilling. Knowing that you're a car with gas, that, that you don't have a key to actually get going and a transmission to get rolling. Like, like we, we have so many people that know what they are but have yet to take that step because they lack that courage, the guts, the faith, the trust. They, they believe there's a God. They might even believe God. But that last thing that God might actually use them to pastor that or to lead that or to serve that or to quit this and to start that or to take that risk or to dare to dream again. Man, there are some people that just have this superpower of imagining a tomorrow that's different from today and then trusting God along the steps to get there. Can I give you something for Christmas? That's what I want to give you. To envision not just who you are but who He is and those two things coming together. See, what's supposed to be happening is this, is I am, God would say, therefore I am, 
like God would say, I am loving. Well, therefore, I am loved. Feel that one for a second, will you? I know we're not about feelings, but feel this one. Is God loving? So are you loved? No, no, God's loving of the planets. I, I, God blows up planets when he feels like it. Have a bad day, blow up a planet. I, he doesn't, but I'm just saying he could. And not blink. But you, the spirit doesn't fall to the ground without the Father knowing about it. How much more are you to him? Every hair on your head's number, Jesus says. That's how valuable you are. Is I am loving? Then you are loved. What about this one? I am merciful, God would say. I am merciful. Therefore, those who would put their trust in God's trigger of mercy, Jesus Christ dying on the cross, living a sinless life, dying in my place, defeating death, hell, and the grave, rising from the dead on the third day, ascending to the right hand of the Father, assigning the apostles and prophets and teachers and evangelists and pastors to go and, and help people find who they are and to go live the dreams that God has for people that he's created. Man, well, if he's merciful, then I am forgiven. And if he's powerful, if he's strong, if he's amazing, then I am strengthened by who he is in my life. You guys still here? Everything we know about God, we know because he wants us to know who he is. And in every revelation that we accept about who God is, we have to accept that, uh, an adjoining revelation of who we are because of him. I'm loving this series so far. You guys doing all right? So here's my, here's my assignment. Most important thing a man thinks is what he thinks when he thinks about God. And can I say something else? The most important thing a woman thinks is what she thinks when she thinks about God. The most important thing about us will not be our pedigree, although pedigree is nice. Education, though education is important. It won't be the chronology of your experiences. The most important thing about you is not who you are, but, and I was a cliche, but whose you are. I mean, not, not just I know that line. I know that God. I will not ever fully realize who God made me to be until I fully embrace who God is. And from that, let God ignite the path before me. Guys, I have a 1.8 GPA from Lakeland High School. I have no senior pastoring experience before coming here. We lived five to $10,000 above our means every year for years after getting here because we couldn't afford to live. Uh, I've been homeless. I've been an addict. I've been the kid you wouldn't let your daughter date. If I walked into a house and you're a good dad, you didn't say hi, you said pull. I am not your pastor because I deserve to be. The only thing that gets me up here week after week and day after day it's not I believe in God. It's not even I believe God. It's this firm belief that somehow to display his glory, his kindness, his mercy, his strength, his power, his wisdom, he uses broken things. He uses weak things. He uses things that don't deserve um, you. I believe God believes in me. In this area, not in every area. I'm over there doing math 10 minutes ago, so I'm no hero. I need God to correct that. Second service, I'll be worshiping differently than the first service because I'm just going to trust God. Why? Because I have the money to deal with, because I have the calendar. I, no, because I have a God that knows the money and the calendar so well. And there's a trajectory for my life. And I just say this to you as we close this morning. Yes, right on time. Let me just move that back. Perfect. Nobody move, but just close your eyes. I'm just going to ask you, where are you at? Do you believe God? Do you believe in God? Do you believe God believes in you? And, I, and I, I will say this too. I think it's okay to say there isn't a yes answer that covers every category because I, I trust God. I believe God believes in me as it pertains to you. But there's, there's things in my future, I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm kind of concerned about, I'm, I'm afraid of, I'm, I don't want to happen, but I'm, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm concerned. Um, so I, I, I mean, I believe in God. That doesn't seem to help. I believe God. That, that's heading in the right direction. There's a rock. There's a foundation. There's an anchor. Man, I'm really, I'm really wrestling for this revelation of who God is in certain areas of my life. 
or I just know I'm not enough. I just know I haven't done enough. I just know that I'm not good enough. I just, I just know. And that's where I'm trying to be those things. And I just hear God saying to me, and maybe by default, I could just echo my wife's word. Maybe he's saying this to you too. Maybe you don't have to have all the answers. Maybe you just need to be a light bulb and let electricity flow through you. Let me, let me move through you. I believe in you. I want you to shine, man. I want you to succeed. I want you to... Everything I've ever dreaded or worried about, it's so strange that none of those things have come to pass. And I wasted all that emotional capital of fearing instead of dreaming. Maybe you're like me. So today, God, I pray, set us free. If you're here today, and you're like, I, I believe in God. That's cool. Would, would you take the next step, though, and believe God? What he says about you, who he is to you and for you, what Jesus has done to redeem you, to buy you back, to love you. And, and if you believe that, would you take another step and just say, man, you know what? Some of you guys, can I, I just feel like it's from the Lord. You've been held back, not by a lack of faith in God, but by a lack of faith in God believing in you. The opportunity, the, the moment, it's just, no, I, I, like Moses, like, no, I, I don't have the, the right pedigree. I don't have the right gifting. I don't have the right past. What if they ask me a question? I can't answer. What, what if something comes up and I don't know? Like, like walking on water, no one's ever done it before. You just kind of do it multiplying loaves and fish. You just kind of do it. Jesus just perfectly did what his father did and said what his father said. And there wasn't this what if, what if, what if. So I would just say to you, listen, I'm not saying be careless. Don't be reckless. But don't be so careful that you miss the fact that God believes in you and has created you for such a time as this to do some pretty cool stuff. Maybe it's time to take a leap of faith. Maybe it's time to say yes. Maybe it's time to say no. Maybe it's time to move. Maybe it's time to stay. I, I I don't know the question you're asking. I'm just saying this. Have, knowing who he is will help you to discover who you are. So, Father, I pray that in Jesus' name. Let us know. Let our hearts know. Let our minds know. Let our testimonies know. Let us trust the testimonies of others that we would know our God and do great exploits. Those who know their God shall do great exploits. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Jim, you just say that's so nice, but I'm, I'm just not even right with God. I got good news for you. Because I am as merciful, you can be forgiven. Because I am as loving. Right now, I know your love, no matter where you've been, what you've done. Whatever you're facing, whatever struggle, whatever addiction, whatever, whatever problem, whatever circumstance, whatever generational curse, whatever it is, I promise you God is greater, and then he will show you a way through showing you himself how to get through this, how to get past this, how to get beyond this, how to use this for his glory. Nothing glorious about homelessness, but I stand up here on a regular basis, tell people I, I've been to a place that most have never been, but God's redeemed that. Addiction is nothing to brag about. I'm not bragging. I'm just, I'm bragging in the delivering power of my God over 31 years now without a single drop of alcohol, drugs, dope, nothing. And I got more highs now than I ever had then. And I'm not hung over the next day, waking up next to some person I've ever met before in my life. Life is better on this side of the cross. Somebody say amen. Come on, God will use it. I'm not right with God, but I want to be. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I'm not right with God, but I want to be. If that's you, would you just raise up your hand right now? All this room. I'm not right with God, but I want to be. Awesome. I love this part. Awesome. I'm not right with God, but I want to be. All right. All right. You braved a blizzard and an ice storm to come and get right with God. He believes in you. Man. Father, I pray for the, the lifted hearts and the lifted hands today today, December 1st, I think it is, would be their second birthday, born again. Say this with me all over this room right now. All of this room, I'm going to lead you in a simple prayer. Just follow me in this way. Just let's go right to him. Say this with me. Jesus, I'm coming to you right here, right now. I was wrong, and you're right. Forgive me of everything. <laughs> I choose you as my Savior. You're my one plan. From this day forward, I belong to you. You belong to me. And I wouldn't have it any other way. Thank you that I am is merciful. So I am forgiven. I am is loving. Therefore, I am loved. I'll see you soon.
Amen. Stand your feet, please, all over this room. You did it, you brave snowmageddon. You made it to church. Hey, no joke. May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine on you. May he lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. May you know the goodness of God in the land of the living. May you believe that he believes in you. May you trust that he's entrusted to you great works, great things, things you won't get credit for because no man can do those things. No woman could have carried that out. And you understand the joy of fulfilling your purpose. Altar workers are coming forward. And if you need prayer for anything at all, we've got the elders of the church. We've got Ninja Turtles. We've got, we've got a variety. We've got the children's section. We've got the... So if you need prayer for anything, please come forward. Are we doing a guest reception? Babe's not here. Yes. Thanks, babe. You got to quit smoking. Your voice got deep. The that room back in that corner, there's an exit sign to the left of the exit sign. That that's the guest room. First, like just come, come hang out. We'd love to talk to you. In the meantime, you know, live long, prosper, Merry Christmas, and we will see you soon. You are dismissed. Need prayer? Come this way.